Can we celebrate all that impact made through Shoreline Church? Yeah. When I saw that video earlier, I was amazed at just how many people who Shoreline has provided food for and clothing for and training for pastors in parts of the world where they can't get that training. It just, it's an amazing joy to be part of this church to see that all that God is doing in and through us. Um, we started last week talking about uh, our resources, material goods, and what, what we do with them, and how we use them, and how God wants to guide us. And I told everybody last week, it's a two-week series, we'll be talking about money this week, so can I say thank you for coming back? <laughs> um, it's a topic that some people tend to avoid, but you didn't, and so I'm glad, I'm glad that you're here. Uh, the, the reality in life is that we can watch how people behave, and we can tell what's happening in their hearts and in their minds, and then we also know that what we think and how we feel impacts how we live our lives. And and um, a few months ago, we had a chance. There was a gentleman who visited Shoreline Church. He came to church. I knew he was coming because he started a ministry for pastors in the, from kind of north of the Bay Area all the way through Monterey, connecting pastors and getting pastors working together. And uh, he's, he's written a book, and I'll show you the book up on the screen here. The book's called The Juggling Act. And it talks about balancing your faith, your family, your friendships, and your work. And that challenge of balancing keeping your faith first and then family and friends and work not dominating everything. Well, this guy who came to visit Shoreline and Sherry and I had lunch with him afterwards, um, one unique thing about him is he was just ranked as the number one CEO in America. He is the head of VMware, a massive tech company and a really committed Christian. And, and he, in this book and in his life, he talks about you have to have your priorities right and you put faith first and then family and friends and then work. And yet somehow he's become the number one CEO in America, ranked by a massive, you know, a massive survey that was done. And so Sherry and I had a chance a couple of months ago to go to a dinner at his home. It was kind of a thing for these pastors from the different parts of the Bay and in his home. And so I thought, you know, when I walk into his home, I'll be able to kind of notice. You, you, you can kind of tell when you walk to someone's home what their values are. You can sort of tell what sports teams they like and where they put their priorities. And so as we went into his house, I just kind of kept my eyes and my ears open because that's how you sort of understand what's really somebody, if they say they believe something and, and they say they're committed to something, but you kind of look closely. I can walk in a pastor's office and look at their library and their books for about five minutes and I can tell you a lot about them. You know what I'm talking about? You can kind of assess people. So I kind of looked around his house. I didn't go like in the drawers and I didn't like go in the bedrooms and stuff, but I just kind of walked around the house. And after kind of making an assessment, you know what I realized? He might have written a book about about you know, faith being the most important thing and family being the most important. But you know what his home said? It said faith was the most important thing. And family, and friends. I watched the way he and his wife Linda conducted themselves. I watched the way they treated people. I looked at their home. And what I realized was what he wrote about and what he says are most important to him actually are. And, and you know, what, we, what we think what we feel and what we commit ourselves to, it shapes our lives. And I think one of the biggest things that shapes our lives is what we think and how we feel about money, about material goods. That's one of the reasons why in the Bible, in the Bible, God talks about giving and money and resources over 2,000 times because this is a big deal to God. And, and so we talked last week about how, what our philosophy of money uh, how it's guided by, is, is it guided by the mind of God? Do, do we think about money the way God wants us to think about money? We talked about that last week. And we asked the question, you know, am, I, am I a spender? You know, a spender says, live it up. It's all about right now. I get my money, I spend it now. It's about living it up. Am I a saver? And that's about sort of adding it up, getting more and more and more. And it's about getting ready for my future. Or am I a servant? And a servant says, send it up. And they invest in eternity. And they're investing in things that last forever. And we looked at this little diagram last week that kind of shows, you know, my take-home income, what money I have, whatever it is. I remember when our kids were little, they would get an allowance of a dollar a week. Well, that was their take-home income, right? That was what they had. You know, whatever I have, little or a lot, whatever comes in, right? And then, do we understand that we're a steward? We're servants that are, we're managing God's resources. We're being stewards of what God has given to us. And then, understanding that, we can spend by investing in the present, we can save and invest in the future, and we can serve by investing, by investing in eternity, but all those three things are part of our lives. But that God should be over all of that. That God's hands should be on that. And today we ask the question, what's your practice in relationship to money? Is it guided by the will of God? Do we not only have the mind of God, but do we have the heart of God? Do we handle our resources in a way that actually honors God and glorifies God? And I know when, when a pastor talks about money and resources, some people get 
get defensive and I don't want to hear about it. And that's why I'm glad you came back for a second week. It's just a two-week series. Next week, we start a six-week series in the book of Proverbs and how wisdom guides all of our relationships. But today, we're talking about, I think, a really important topic. And I want to invite you to do something today. I want to invite you to open your heart to whatever God wants to say and open your mind to whatever God wants to speak to you. Because here's what I've learned being a pastor now for a lot of decades now. I've been a pastor for a long time. I can't change anyone's mind, and I can't change anyone's heart, and I can't change anyone's life. The only person I can really do that with through the power of the Holy Spirit is my own life. But I can preach God's word and preach it with truth and let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart. And so I want to ask if you will invite me today to bring the fire and get a preach going on. If you want to invite me to, I want you to say, Pastor, bring the fire. You know, the thing about third service, I don't know if she's got more sleep, but you're always the first time you bring, you, so I want you, one more time, pastor, bring the fire. Pastor, bring the fire. <coughs> well, since you asked, <laughs> I, want, I want to challenge you with a topic that can change your life, and I believe this. If you get a hold of resources the way God wants you to, it will change every part of your life. So I'm going to share seven biblical principles. And those seven biblical principles, I hope, will help you, will encourage you. I do need to let you know, we've had a, a, bit, a bunch of events that Sharon and I have been a part of, so I've been speaking almost every night for five nights in a row, plus preaching the first and second service. But I'm going to give you everything that's left of my voice. Uh, so I'll promise to give you all I have, but I'm going to have to uh, sip a little water and be a little bit careful, but I'm going to still bring the fire here because you asked me to, okay? <laughs> biblical principle number one, everything we have and receive actually belongs to God. Get this one right, it'll change your life. Get this one wrong, and it's really hard to be generous. Everything we have and receive actually belongs to God. Psalm 21, 24.1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. One way, one way to translate is, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Do you understand that everything on this planet was God's before you and I came along? And everything will be God's after we're gone. God's on the throne. He rules and reigns over everything. So when we understand that everything is ultimately a gift from God and it comes from him, it changes our perspective. James chapter 1, verse 16, we read this. James 1, 16. He says, don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. Everything you have that's good, it's from God. You say, well, you know, what about my physical strength that I have to do my work? That's from God. What about my mental capacity to do the work I do and to think? That's from God. What, what, what about the, my talents and my unique ways of coming and perspective on life? That's from God. It's all a gift from God. It even hit me years ago, um, I think even our energy, the energy, we all have different kinds of levels of energy. Our energy is a gift from God. Now, when I was growing up, I had a lot of energy, and my parents, I don't think we're totally sure it was a gift from God, uh, but, uh, but I believe it was. I've, I've always been a super high energy kid. I'll put it this way. I had five principles going through grade school, five different principles. I got to know them all personally. <laughs> and they got to know me pretty personally too. Um, I've always been just, and I don't drink coffee. I don't do caffeine. I'm just, I, have, I just have this crazy energy, right? And, I, and about 20 years ago, here's what God put on my heart. Kevin, one day you'll stand before me. And you'll give account for everything I've given to you, including your energy. And so I try to leverage even my energy to, to, to serve the Lord. I, that I can get a lot more done in a day than some people. It's like, okay, then don't just cut off halfway through the day and quit. Oh, I got everything. No, what else can I do to serve the Lord? And, and I think that everything we have, if we see everything as a gift, we have a whole different outlook on our lives. And so biblical principle number one, everything we have is, and receive actually belongs to God. So, here's the so. We see ourselves as stewards and not owners. We long to be faithful with what God has trusted to us. God has everything, but he entrusts certain things. We each get entrusted with certain things. And we get to decide how we're going to respond to the things he's entrusted to us. But it's still his. I'll give you kind of a fun example. When our boys were growing up, when they were little, we lived in Michigan, and my folks were in California. So every year they would send a check for Christmas gifts for the boys, and they'd have us pick things out in Michigan. And then Sherry's parents would give a check for Christmas things. We'd actually put those together, and instead of getting a lot of little stuff that would break after a day or two, we'd get one big thing for Christmas from grandpa and grandma on both sides of the family. And one year we got a trampoline. 
I mean a full size, like real trampoline. It wouldn't be legal in California probably because you could hurt yourself, but, but you know, in Michigan, everything's legal. So, um, so I actually dug a hole in our backyard and put it in the ground so the trampoline was level with the grass. And then, and then I put in an adjustable basketball hoop next to the trampoline so the boys could do a slam dunk co- contest off the trampoline. Does that sound like fun? Okay, and so anyways, uh, so, so now we had this incredibly fun area in our backyard with a trampoline and a basketball thing next to the trampoline, and we told all the neighborhood kids, this is ours, it belongs to us, you can't play here because we're Christians, <laughs> right? No. We actually looked and said, this doesn't just belong to us. Now, we had rules like how many kids could bounce at a time and that kind of stuff so people wouldn't get hurt, but we, but we basically looked and said, look what God has given to our neighborhood, and we shared it. We were learning that everything we have is a gift from God, and you use it for his glory. For Sherry and I, we grapple with this every day. We, we believe, and I learned from my wife. I grew up in a non-Christian home, so I didn't learn to be generous growing up in terms of giving to God's work, but Sherry did. I'll tell more about that later, but, but we basically, you know, we look at everything we have, and we say, okay, God, we're not the owners of this. We're stewarding what's yours. So in the last two months, and, and, and some people think with pastors you know, and, and Christians, well, don't talk about finances. You shouldn't, that's, not, that's not Christian. We should talk about finances like we talk about everything as Christians. So I can tell you, I can tell you with, with humility and by God's grace as, on our journey of finances that our first 10% of everything we earn comes to Shoreline Church. That's called a tie, the first 10%. It comes to Shoreline Church. And now we're at a point where we can actually give more than that to Shoreline. And we give to other ministries. But in the last two months, three different ministries made appeals for us to be part of. One was Organic Outreach International, a ministry that's part of Shoreline Church, and we had to pray about what can we give towards that. One was Shoreline's our, our 25th anniversary. We're inviting people to give towards the next 25 years. We had to pray about that. And then we're speaking at World Mission's 25-year celebration. It's a big fundraiser for World Mission that does the audio solar-powered Bibles that we're part of, and that's a partner with Shoreline. And so we had to pray about all three of those and giving a gift above what we already give. And so we prayed about it and God put it on our hearts. Each time we prayed, I think in all three cases, we gave more than we would have given if we hadn't prayed. We said, well, what can we give this? When we prayed, we were moved to give more. And, and that, that is just part of our journey. And we look at it now and we just go, thank you, Lord. Because, and, and, and actually, two of the gifts we're gonna give over time because we can't give it all right now, but we know that God's calling us to give it. But here's the thing, we're in it together. That's part of the call of God. And I want to challenge you, to, and, and, and here's the reality. Here's the reality for us. If we saw all of our money as ours, that would be really hard. We got to give more of our money. But we don't. It's not ours. So all we're doing is taking what belongs to God that's in our care and taking it and putting it in somebody else's care. It's easier to give it away if I don't see it as mine. I'm more generous with God's money, Right? because it's all his. I want to encourage you to get that kind of perspective. So that's principle number one. Everything we have and receive actually belongs to God. Get that in your heart and your mind. Principle number two, the wealth and possessions in our care should be used for God's purposes and glory. So it's all God's, but you look at what God's put in your care and say, okay, how can we use this for God's glory? How do we utilize the resources that God's given to us for the glory of God? Do you ever ask that question? How can I use this to glorify God? the things that we have, material things or financial resources. So we're encouraged to use God's resources as he would. There's a great parable in Luke chapter 12 where Jesus is talking about this manager who leaves and he puts one of his servants in charge of his estate. He says, well, I'm gone. You'll take care of the servants, pay them and and, and, and just be responsible. It's It's my stuff, but I'm asking you to take care of it. Kind of like what God does with us. So look at verse 42 of Luke 12. The Lord answered, Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food uh, food allowance at the proper time? And this line's important, verse 43. It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. Jesus says in the story, when the master returns and the servant he's put in charge, the master's gonna look at the servant and say, did you conduct yourself with my stuff like I thought you should? And he says, it'll be good for you if you were using my stuff the right way. And he also says, it's going to be a problem if you weren't. So here's my question of you. If you're a steward of all that God has given you, and God showed up today, would he look at how you're using all of his things he's put in your care, and would he say, good job? Or would he say, we got to make some adjustments here. 
And here's my suggestion. Make those adjustments now. Look and say, but if God showed up and said, you know, you had to make some adjustments in how you're using your resources, then make them willingly, make them now, and make those adjustments for the glory of God. But God wants us to use his resources as he would, and then God's resources are also for our enjoyment, <clears throat> our enjoyment as well. God wants us to enjoy the things that he gives to us. So 1 Timothy 6, 17 says this. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God. Listen to this. Who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. God is a loving father and he gives us things so we can enjoy them. So we can have fun with ourselves, with our spouse, with our friends, with our children, with our family. God actually blesses us with things so we can enjoy them. So, so you're kind of like, oh, wait, wait, wait a minute now. When, when I have things in my care that belong to God, is it that I'm supposed to use them for his glory and his purposes or use them for my enjoyment? And here's the answer, both. Because you know what? One of his purposes is your enjoyment. God delights when you delight and enjoy things. But there's this balance of, of okay, when I, God provides things, how do I use them for his glory? How do I use them for my enjoyment? And you're kind of like, well, how do I fit those together? What's the exact amount I should use for God's purposes and the exact amount for my enjoyment? Here's my answer. You ready? I have no idea for you. And I don't have to answer for you. I have to answer for me. And we have to answer for our family and our resources. So we're continually praying, Lord, what part of this is to be used to help work in the kingdom and what part of it is to be used for fun and enjoyment? And both honor God. But you have to discern what that looks like. But I do know this. Some of what God puts in your care is to be used for his purposes and for his work in the world and some is to be used for enjoyment, which is part of God's purposes. But you have to discern and figure out the balance of those things. So biblical principle number two. The wealth and possessions in our care should be used for God's purposes and glory. So, here's our so, we seek to spend, save, and serve prayerfully and be led by the Holy Spirit in all of our financial actions. I have a question for you. Do you pray about how you use your money? Do you, do you spend time thinking, well, this is not just mine, this is God's. And Holy Spirit, lead and guide me. When you're, when you're walking in a store and you turn a corner on the end caps, they always have like put impulse buy things. You're like, oh, I should grab one of these. Do you ever say, well, Lord, do I really need that? Lord, can I use that money for something else? And do you pray and talk to God and think about how you use your resources? And for a lot of people, their response is, well, I don't have any resources. I'm broke. You know, I, I, I don't have to pray about it. You know, my, Sherry and I, the first three years of our married life, we lived below the poverty level. We, we literally, when we did our taxes, they, said, they, they kept saying, oh, you're below the poverty level. You're below the poverty level for three years. But because my wife grew up in a home where God's purposes came first, she grew up in a home where literally her dad would get his paycheck, was paid weekly, get his paycheck, go to the bank and cash it. I mean, like, turn the, give him the paycheck and they would give him cash money. Some of you don't even know what that is, but there's like paper and coins that are actually real money. And, uh, and so he would cash it and he would sit in the dining room table and he would take the first tenth of everything he earned, he would put in the envelope and he put it on top of the refrigerator. And that went in the offering plate on Sunday. That was for the work of Jesus. Sherry watched that every week of her life and watched her dad every Sunday go and take that envelope and put it for God's work, investing in eternity, investing in the things of Jesus. And she watched that her whole life. So before, when we started talking about getting married, she asked me, are you committed to give the first 10% towards God's work? And we had to have a big conversation because I wasn't living that way. I was, I was not giving, gener I wasn't giving at all. I was gonna be a pastor. And everything was on because I said, I'm broke. Well, here's, here's what we figured out. She, uh, at, at that point, I was making $400 a month. I was working 50 to 60 hours a week in a church. They paid me $100 a week, $400 a month. So 10% of that, $40. We, started, we committed $40 every single month to God's work. And we were completely broke. But the way that God provided was miraculous. And God's blessings were miraculous. And now, years later, giving the first 10% is like easy. That's not even, it's not even up for discussion. It's what can we give beyond that? I, but, but I had to learn how to be generous. And you know who taught me? My wife. She taught me what it looks like to live a life where you understand that all you have is a gift from God and it should be used for his glory and for his purposes. And, and so I wanna also give you a challenge when you think about Shoreline Church. 
For some of you, and, and I, I talk with people who say things like this. People will say, well, Shoreline, you know, I, I'll give something, I'll give something, but I'm not going to give to Shoreline because they got big screens, so they don't need any money. Well, I'm not going to give to Shoreline because we give away free donuts. And, we're too, you know, and, and people have reasons why they don't give. And sometimes they, why they won't give to Shoreline. Let, let me tell you, what, what God is doing through Shoreline is profound and powerful. And God's put us in this unique community to have an impact. And when I look at the numbers of, of bagels eaten, but also people that receive clothes and people that receive food and people that heard the gospel preach them and people that have gotten audio solar-powered Bibles because of this church's generosity, uh, giving to Shoreline is very meaningful for the kingdom. And one more thing about Shoreline, we live with what I call manna for the day. What that means in, in ancient Israel, God would provide enough manna for every single day. So every couple of weeks as our offerings come in, it's about enough money to pay our bills and to pay our staff. And it's almost, it's almost like right there. We don't have a big surplus. If you look around and say, well, we must be sitting on tons of money. We actually put new carpet in here finally after years that need to be done, but we still need to do the balcony. Balcony people, sorry about how ugly your carpet is, but someday. Uh, but there's things, there's things that we need to do. And so when you think about giving, think about not just other things, but Shoreline also is doing great ministry, and I encourage you to pray about that. But, but we need to invest in the things of the kingdom. Biblical principle number three. Wealth is like dynamite, it has great potential for both good and harm. Dynamite can open up, you know, open up a pathway for a train to go through, and dynamite can also kill people if it blows up around people. And money's like that too. Money can be used in beautiful ways, and also it can be very, very dangerous. And the Apostle Paul, writing to Timothy, who was a, pa a young pastor in the city of Ephesus, writes these words in 1 Timothy 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into a temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. The Bible doesn't say money is evil, but it does say falling in love with money can ruin your life. So we have to decide what's our priority going to be. And we have to understand that there's, there's potential dangers with, fall, dangers with saying, I love money more than I love God, and money will rule my life. And you know, you can be in love with money and have nothing, a moderate amount, or a lot of money. Being in love with money is not about how much you have, it's about your heart's desire for it. And you don't want that to rule you. So principle number three, wealth is like a dynamite. It has great potential for both good and harm. So we will be humble and careful when it comes to how we interact with money and all it can buy and do. That we will say, God, let me be careful. Let me not fall in love with money. Let me remember, let me remember that everything's a gift from you. And I want to live with open hands and an open heart. Biblical principle number four, worldly wealth is fleeting Heavenly treasure is eternal. Worldly wealth is fleeting. Heavenly treasure is eternal. Jesus puts it this way in Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The Bible says that what we invest in this life is very temporary. Does anybody remember the year 2008? Anybody remember what happened to the American economy in 2008? Before 2008, I heard so many people say this. Right? They'd say this. You can't lose money in real estate. I heard that before 2008. I heard people, guess what people said after 2008? You can lose money in real estate. It flipped upside down. You got... All the stuff in this world that we think we can hold on to, it, it's transitory. It can just disappear. But when we invest in eternity, when we invest in the things of God, no one can take that away. The impact it has, you, know, you looked up on that screen earlier with that, with that video, the people that have been fed, the clothing that have been given, the people that have been trained, the ministry you've done, nothing can change that. Invest in things that last forever. There's a biblical passage that really has become one that's transformed my life. And it started transforming my life uh, when Sherry and I first met and we began talking about getting married. And she told me I would have to learn to be generous or she wasn't going to marry me. And she actually told me. She said, you've got, you've got to 
lead our family, be a godly man. And if you're not being generous, you're not being a godly man. And she, she laid it out for me. And I, I praise God for that. But one of the passages I began to read and study and grapple with is Malachi chapter three. And Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament, right before Matthew, the first book of the New Testament. And in Malachi chapter three, there's this, this interaction where God's talking to the people and the people are talking to God about stuff, about money. And here's how the interaction goes in verse eight, Matthew, uh, Malachi three, verse eight. God asks, will mere mortals rob God? Yet you rob me. God's telling his people, but you're robbing me. But you ask, the people of God ask, how are we robbing you? And then God responds, in tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. This is God talking to his people. He says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. God says, you become generous. You start giving. And then God says something that he only says once in the whole Bible. Test me in this. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, don't test God. But here it says, God says one time, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven <clears throat> and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. God says, I'm gonna pour out a blessing like you can't even imagine. And then he says, and I'll protect you. I'll prevent your pests from devouring your crops and the vines of your field will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all, I love this, then all the nations will call you blessed. For yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. If you're a note taker, write these three things down. These are three important things. One, not giving is a form of robbing God. Not giving is a form of robbing God. What do you, how can that be? Well, if it's all God's and God says, you give the first to me, and we don't do that, God says, we're stealing from him. And, and, and you, you told me to bring the fire? You told me to bring it today? I'm telling you. And, and can I tell you something? I, I want for every person who's part of Shoreline Church. And if you're part of another church, give to your church. Don't give it to your, if you, if you go to two churches and you're here too, you can share your giving. But, but if you're part of another church just visiting, what I'm saying is true for you when you go back home to your church. You know, learn to give with generosity. Learn to give consistently. It, it will transform your life. And I, I know that, that if you grow in generosity, it will change your life. And can I tell you something? When I, when I encourage you to give, when I encourage you to give to your home church, if you're part of Shoreline, give to this church. I don't work on commissions and I don't work on bonuses. Everybody hearing me? I don't make a penny more. If the offerings at Shoreline go up, I don't make a penny more. I don't even touch the church money. Sometimes people will forget to put their offering and they'll come up to you after the service and say, Pastor, can I get? And I'm like, nope. I literally go, nope. I don't touch that. I'll say, give it to somebody else or give it to one of our ushers, put it in the offering plate, or there's a thing in, in the lobby like this uh, mailbox you can put in there, but I, I don't even touch it. The only money I get is what the board votes every year that I get paid, and that's what I get paid. It provides for me and my family. We give our first percentage back to the, the work of the church, and then we live off the rest. And, try to, and, and that's how we, so, so I don't challenge you to give because I get something out of it. I mean that with all my heart. But I want you to live the best life possible. And God has been so good, and even for, for sharing it, even when we lived below the poverty line, giving transformed our lives. And we were investing in the work of the church. And when the church did things, we could say, we're part of that. Praise God. I want that for you. And I encourage you to start somewhere. Start somewhere. But this, this passage challenges you. Not giving is a form of robbing God. So deal with that. Next, this is the only time we're called to test God. In all the Bible, it's the only time where God says, listen, I know it's hard for you. I know you're afraid. So test me. Try it. You try being generous and you see if I don't open heaven and pour out the floodgates. It doesn't mean necessarily more money, but you will have blessing upon blessing. When Sherry and I lived for three years below the poverty line, we didn't have a lot more money in those three years when we were faithful in giving, but we were blessed beyond description. Things that I wouldn't trade for any amount of money, honestly. God's blessings come in many shapes and many forms. And then the third thing to write down is this. Giving leads to an overflowing blessing monetarily, spiritually, in every way. I believe that when we learn to be generous and give freely, God blesses us. And I actually believe people that are truly aware that everything they have is a gift from God and they open their hands and share, God will put more in their hands so they can share more for his glory. I watch God, do, I watch God provide for people who live with generosity so they can keep being generous for his glory. So principle number four, worldly wealth is fleeting, heavenly treasure is eternal. So invest in what lasts forever. So we will be sure that eternal investments matter more than the next toy, experience, or acquisition. We're gonna make sure that the things that last forever are gonna be the things that we invest in. And I wanna challenge you to start somewhere. 
I want to challenge you that wherever your church home, if you call showing church home here, if you're part of another church, there. If you go to multiple churches, then you know, share your giving. But, but every week or every month, give something to God's work. Don't just walk into church and go, oh, there's that stupid envelope. I hate that they put an envelope in here. But say, and whether you give online or on the Shoreline app or in the offering, it all goes in the same place. But every week or every month, give something. You say, well, I, all I can give is $3. Do it. It will unleash something in you. And you'll start finding other ways to be generous. And then you'll find somebody in, in need as you're walking through the day and you're gonna go, you know what, here, yeah, I can help you. It'll, it'll change everything. You'll, you'll become more like Jesus. So I challenge you to take that step. Biblical principle number five. Giving should be voluntary, generous, and even sacrificial. Cheerful and based on needs. We see needs and we respond. We're joyful. So 2 Corinthians 9 says this. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. It's a farming metaphor, but you sow more, you get more. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly, not pushing back, not under compulsion, not feeling forced, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, I love this, so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, not all you want, but all you need, give us this day our daily bread, right? You will abound in every good work. I, I, wanna, I wanna challenge you to really think about what it means to grow in generosity. Biblical principle number five, giving should be voluntary, generous, even sacrificial, cheerful, and based on needs. So we search our heart, we seek to grow a generous spirit, and we learn to be sacrificial. We ask the question, what's my next step in growing in generosity? What's the next step for you? I don't know. But I know the next step for Sherry and I because we're gonna ask the Lord about it. And he's given us some challenges recently and we're responding to that. And I know that every time we're faithful in taking that step, God blesses us and we take a next step. So I want, you, I want to challenge you. What, you know, for some of you, your next step is just to say, I'm going to start doing something. I've, some of you are going to say, I've never, I've never given anything to the work of the church. And I'm going to start doing something. Start there. You're giving, take a next step. Take a next step and follow the Lord. Biblical principle number six. Giving to the poor, forgotten, and truly needy is the duty of Christians who live in a broken world. This is part of God's call. So giving to people in need, the fact that we have a food pantry, a clothing closet, the fact that we help in so many ways. Christmas is coming up and we're gonna be involved in, I don't even know how many, four, five, six different ministries at Christmas time helping people in, in need. People around, around this country, people around the world. Be part of that. Engage in helping people in need. In Matthew 25, Jesus is talking about when he comes again at the end of time and when God brings all the nations in front of him. And this is what it says in Matthew 25. Then the king will say, the king is Jesus, the king will say to those on his right, come you bl who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. And here's what Jesus says. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you invited me in. I needed clothes, you clothed me. I was sick, you looked after me. I was in prison, you came to visit me. And he goes on saying, the people say, well, when, Jesus, we don't remember seeing you. He says, when you did it to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did it for me. Serving people in need is what Christians do. And taking some of what God's given to us and helping people in need is what Christians do. We have a bunch of care and compassion ministries at Shoreline Church that when you give, they're supporting that. But we need volunteers to serve in those ministries. We, invited Dave, we introduced David and Lauren and his family a couple weeks ago, but David's leading our community outreach, our global outreach, our shoreline outreach, and some other parts of our ministry here at the church. And, and we need not just 10 or 20, but you know, hundreds of people in the coming months to do all the things we try to do to serve our community. You can be part of that. Give some of your time, give some of your resources, be part of that. Love Our Central Coast is coming up. This Saturday, from nine in the morning till noon, if you don't have something like rock solid on your calendar, I challenge you when the service is done to go through the courtyard, go to that booth and just say, how can I get involved next Saturday? And give one, two, or all three hours. And just and be the hands and the heart and the mouth of Jesus, sharing his love with our community. Giving to the poor, forgotten, and truly needy is the duty of Christians who live in a broken world. So we keep our eyes open, our hearts soft, and our resources available when God calls us to give. We're ready, we're willing, and we're excited. And then biblical principle number seven. 
Giving generously breaks the power of money and the influence of things in our lives. When we give generously, we break the, the, bound, the, 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 the chains and, and the bonds of stuff ruling our lives. Jesus says, don't let stuff be your God. Don't let it be your master. And it's interesting, we think of this as sort of a modern thing, but listen to this quote from a guy named uh, Cyprian, Bishop of Carthage, in the third century. So the third century, and he wrote this about Christians who are struggling with being too in love with their stuff. He wrote, their property held them in chains. They think of themselves as owners, whereas it is they, it is they rather who are owned. And that's not, they think they're the owners, they're actually owned. Whereas it is rather they who are owned, enslaved as they are to their own property. They are not the masters of their money, but it's slaves. He looked at people and said, you become enslaved to your stuff. Rather than owning it and using it for God's glory, it's taken over. It's become your God. So Jesus says this in Matthew 6. No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You can't have two gods in your life. You can't have two lords. You can't have two masters. You have to pick one, and the two that really fight is God and stuff. Money can take over, and we've got to be careful. So biblical principle number seven. Giving generously breaks the power of money and influence of things in our lives. So... We identify where money and things have us captive. And we cry out for God to help us break the chains and walk in freedom. We actually look at our life and say, where is the love and the pursuit of money taking over my life? And again, you don't have to be wealthy for that to be a problem. You can be struggling financially, but you're the main thing you think about and that drives your life is money and acquiring stuff. Then it's become the ruler of your life and God wants to set you free. So let me give you one more challenge. Find something. If you, feel like you're, you're, if you feel like money has too much of a grip on you or you think about it too much or struggle with it too much, find something that you have that you, that you don't use, that you don't need, or maybe you do like and do need, but you, you pray and say, God, I want to break the power of money over me, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to get rid of something. And put it, on, you know, put it on, on eBay, put it online, sell it, and give that money to a mission, to a ministry, to Shoreline Church, if you're from another church, to your home church. Give that money away somewhere. And that might be, for some of you, it might be a $5 thing. For other people, some of you, it might, might be hundreds of dollars. For some of you, it might be thousands of dollars. If you're like, well, you know, I'm having a hard time because, you know, in my storage barn where I keep my 20 classic cars, I don't have room for a 21st one. And that's, you say, well, then sell one or two of them and give the, work, give the money to the work of Jesus. What? You're crazy. No, I'm a pastor. And, uh, and I'm saying, it could set you free. It could set, it could set you free. And it could also be used to invest in eternity. Little things and big things. Start giving something. Make it part of your lifestyle. Maybe you go, I don't have any money to give, but I, you know, but I do go to Starbucks twice a day. Then go once a day. Ah, what? You know, and, the, and, and the time you don't go, set that money aside and commit it to the work of Jesus. Get engaged in some way in growing in generosity. Pray about it, grapple with it. So what's my next step to grow in joyful generosity? Here's my answer. I don't know. You say you're a pastor, you're supposed to know. I don't know about your life. I know about the life of Jesus. And I know if you're a follower of Jesus, there is a next step. It could, for some of you, it might be the first step, a step I took when I first met Sherry, where I said, okay, I'll start doing something. But I know this, if you take that step, God will show up and God will bless it and you will, it, it will impact your life in beautiful, powerful ways and he will provide all you need. He will. Lord Jesus, we pray as we pause right now to give back as part of our worship, Lord, we give back. Lord, some of us have our giving already set up on our computer and we know it's gonna hit this week and we just pray right now, Lord, use that money for your glory. Some people are gonna use the Shoreline app and that's how they're gonna give. And Lord, they're just let them pray, Lord, use these resources for your glory. And Lord, some are gonna put money in the offering plate or a check in the offering plate and that's the way they're gonna give and they're praying, Lord, use this for your glory. But our prayer, Lord, is that we would recognize and acknowledge how good you've been to us. And right now, as we give back, may we do it with joy and excitement and delight to share in the work of Jesus through the ministry of the local church. As you give back right now, do it with joy in your hearts and do it for the glory of Jesus.